I would like to introduce um, uh, Kim Whitmore and Jill Kagan as our first presenters. It's a very international session we have today. Kim Whitmore is an assistant professor in the College of Nursing at Marquette University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and a research consultant with Arch National Respite Network and Resource Center in the United States. Much of her current research is focused on understanding and addressing the respite uh, care needs of families. And she will be presenting together with uh, Jill Kagan, who is the director of the Arch National Respite Network and Resource Center, which houses a lifespan respite technical assistance and resource center funded by the US Administration for Community Living. She serves on numerous uh, national advisory boards, including the executive committee for the CDC funded Public Health Center of Excellence in Dementia Caregiving at the University of Minnesota and uh, the Duke UCLA National Child Traumatic Stress Network Advisory Committee. Jill represents ARCH on numerous national coalitions, including the Consortium for Citizens with Disabilities, the National Alliance for Caregiving Advocacy, uh, Collaborative, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Caregiver Workgroup, and the National uh, Child Abuse Prevention Partners of the US Children's Bureau. Um, Thank you so much, uh, Jill and Kim, for being with us today, and um, over to you. Great, thank you so much for that great introduction. I'm Kim Whitmore, and honored to be presenting with Jill Kagan. I'm gonna get us started here today to talk about the untold secrets about the power of research to improve outcomes for carers. In this presentation, we hope to be able to help describe the importance of respite research, discuss strategies for ensuring that research is focused on equity and diversity, provide specific examples of how attendees can get involved in support research efforts, regardless of your role or experience in research. And then Jill will spend some time describing the evolution and progress of a respite research initiative that was undertaken by ARCH in the US. And then finally, I will share some information about how you can get involved with our break exchange. So our overarching goal for this is really to help demystify research. As I mentioned earlier, no matter what your interest level or experiences with research, we hope you walk away from this presentation sort of understanding how important it is and how easy it is to get involved and support research in different ways. So we know that there is an abundant source of research centered around caregivers. What we know, um, you know, some main things we know about caregiving is that being a caregiver increases stress and fatigue. It can lead to a poor quality of life. It often causes marital stress, which can lead to higher divorce rates. There's often financial stress and job loss that occurs, and it can put individuals at a greater risk for abuse and neglect. However, we don't know as much about respite care as an intervention to support family caregivers. There is some literature that shows and suggests that respite care may decrease stress and other negative health outcomes. And we have a couple of studies that have shown that respite care needs are largely unmet. But in general, respite care, at least in the United States, is primarily based on what uh, Dr. Ray Kirk and Jill Kagan have uh, stated in a publication previously, on practical ideas and good intentions. So we hope to be able to change that and we wanna help stimulate and get people excited about engaging in more respite related research. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, we know that having a stronger evidence base and research helps us to understand and develop model practices for different respite programs. It helps to build that evidence base for respite care. It can support quality improvement efforts of existing services and programs. And in the end, it can really help improve the lives and well-being of caregivers and care recipients. It allows us to have data and information that can support advocacy efforts to promote the needs of caregivers and care recipients. And it also can be used to help drive funding and policy changes to help ensure that we are using our resources in the best way to support family caregivers. So I'm not gonna talk a ton about this because uh, Jill Kagan's gonna share a little bit more about this, but I wanna just set the stage with a really important document that if you haven't had a chance to review this, encourage you to head to the ARCH website and download a copy of the Research Agenda for Respite Care. This document um, provides a really great inclusive definition of respite. I think generally we all think of respite or short breaks as that temporary break from caregiving. But what I love about this definition that was put forth in these recommendations is the second half. So the first half essentially is that break from caregiving. 
but this, this adds and which results in some measurable improvement in the well-being of the caregiver, care recipient, and or family. So really thinking about what's the outcome of the respite, that it's not just a break, it's what occurs because of the break. And that's really important to think about respite, not just as a program, but as an outcome of receiving that break from care. In the, in the document, there are six key areas for recommendations for future research. And I'm just going to briefly go over those here. Um, some things that we need to do in respite related research is ensure that we have studies that are addressing some of the foundational methodological concerns. So in, ensuring that our studies follow good designs um, with how the studies are conducted. We want to make sure that we're actually intentionally researching and trying to measure those outcomes, both individual and family and societal outcomes. There's a huge gap in the literature and a need to conduct more research that looks at cost benefit and cost effectiveness of respite care. And we also need re research that focuses on um, understanding system change to help improve respite access, as well as looking at research that strives to improve and understand how to improve respite provider competencies. And finally, the last key area talks about the need to be able to conduct translational research. So research where it's not just ending in a, a publication that presents some results, but it's actually translated into practice and policy change to continue to, to move respite forward. Next, I wanna share a little bit about the importance of having an equity lens on research. So I'll start by just clarifying some, some very basic definitions. Um, in my mind, these aren't like, you know, cited from anyone, but how I explain diversity, inclusion, and equity. So diversity is really different perspectives. Inclusion is that sense of feeling welcome and belonging and equity is fairness. So when we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, we often default to thinking about racial and ethnic equity, inclusion, and diversity. I think in the disability field, we often can understand the importance of looking at the differences in abilities and age across the lifespan. But there's many other social identity constructs that we need to consider when we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion in our work. What I like about this diagram from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is that it helps us to understand the difference between equity and equality. So equality is sameness. It's giving everyone the same resource or the same service or support. So in this diagram, if we give everyone the same bike, that's not gonna necessarily work for everyone and allow them to live their best lives. If we give everyone the bike that matches their needs, that is equity. So as you can see in the bottom image, ensuring that people get the type of support and resources they need to be healthy and well in the world. Another way to look at this is the five rights of respite care. So in nursing, I have a background as a nurse, we often refer to the five rights of medication administration that we have to give the right person, the right medication at the right time and the right dose and the right route. And if we think about that in the analogy of respite care, we really need to make sure we're giving the right family the right type of respite care at the right time in their life, in the right duration, and in the right location that works for that family. Another way to look at this is on this concept map that I developed through some research done previously that looks at how in the literature, we, we know that in order for respite care to have those positive outcomes of decreasing stress and improving quality of life, that the respite care services really need to meet the family needs. So if you focus on the puzzle board in the middle, there's things like cost, safety, and trust in the provider that all have to match the family needs in order for respite to have that positive outcome. If any of those puzzle pieces fall out, for example, if the family doesn't trust the provider, that can actually lead to increased stress by receiving respite care and could decrease family quality of life. So it's important to tailor our respite services to the unique needs of families. Another way to think about equity and equality is um, in this illustration where we look at it from a community level. So thinking about how there may be different populations within our community, different groups of people, different age groups, for example, or different disability groups that are not necessarily getting equitable access to resources. So if we give everyone the same access to resources, we will not see equal outcomes. We want to make sure, again, that we're giving the right amount of resources based on the needs of that population. So as we think about equity, diversity, and inclusion in research, we can think about areas to improve that across the six key recommendations that were mentioned previously. And some really intentional things to consider 
when we're engaging in research are listed here. So we can strive to have research studies that intentionally address disparities and equities, studies that focus on diverse populations, studies that engage community partners in the research, which is really important to make sure that our research is developed with and for the communities that we're serving. A great way to do that is to engage a community advisory board to help inform every step of the process. And this is something that anyone can be involved in. So if you're a family caregiver or you're working with a respite program and you don't know a whole lot about research, you could become a part of a community advisory board to support research to make sure that what is being done in the research project is meaningful to you. And then another step that's really important in engaging in inclusive research is to make sure that in addition to having your peer-reviewed manuscript published in a journal, um, we want to be able to provide back plain language summaries of findings to the community and, and close that circle of knowledge that we find in our studies. And so some things to think about that are important for researchers, but also as participants and researchers or partners in research is listed here. So is your research team actually diverse, representative and inclusive? Do you have someone that has lived experience as a part of your research team? Are you cultivating authentic relationships with diverse stakeholders? So do you have a good sense of what are really the issues and what are the questions that need to be addressed in research from the perspective of family caregivers, care receivers, and respite providers? We also can ask ourselves if we're engaging stakeholders at all stages of the research process. So are they involved in formulating the questions that we wanna research? Do they help uh, um, inform the design and how we recruit people into our studies? how we collect data, how we analyze it, and how we disseminate that information back out. Those are all stages that you can use a community advisory board to help at each of those stages to support your work. And then another thing that's very important is to make sure that you're really being reflective on thinking about what are those implicit biases that you or your team may need to unlearn in order to avoid having biased data collection or bias dissemination. And then lastly, thinking about what are those inequities that really need to be prioritized in your work. So ways that you can get involved in building a culture of respite care is by partnering with academic researchers or evaluators, by helping to identify those projects or questions. So really in practice, if you have you know, a question or you're curious about something or you're always wondering, like, I wonder what happens if, or I wonder if this is actually working or what difference we're making, those are all questions that can be framed in research projects and worked on in partnership with researchers and evaluators. You can participate in identifying potential measures. You can help with advocating for research funding. You can also help with disseminating the findings of research. So especially if you have researchers who are giving you those plain language summaries back to help um, invite them to share information back with your community and help with that translation back into practice as well. So one way that you can get um, really intentionally involved in research and help get connected with a great community is by joining the Break Exchange. So the Break Exchange stands for Building Respite Evidence and Knowledge. And the Break Exchange is an incredible international group of researchers, respite providers, agencies, and individuals who are committed to building that culture of evidence-based respite care. We have um, some incredible partners in this work that are listed on this slide here. Um, ARCH, the International Short Break Association, Shared Care Scotland, the University of Wisconsin-Madison and Marquette University. And we currently have almost 200 members from 15 countries that are part of this great network. There's lots of benefits to joining. You can get connected with others, learn from and with each other about evidence-based practices and promising programs of research. It's a great place to share. We have monthly networking hours. Um, we have a monthly newsletter and we host webinars that we invite you to um, contact us and let us know if there's anything we can do to help get information out about what you're doing through the Break Exchange. <coughs> Excuse me. And then finally, it's a great opportunity to collaborate and find partners in your projects. So here are some ways that you can stay connected to the Break Exchange. And I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Jill. Thank you so much, Kim. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here and I only have a few minutes, so I'm going to zip through these slides. Um, I am the director of ARCH. We provide lots of training and technical assistance as well as uh, policy advocacy through our National Respite Coalition uh, and services directly to family caregivers through our National Respite Locator Service. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Kim already talked about this report, but this does represent a major initiative of ours since 2013. 
uh, to encourage more research to strengthen the evidence base for respite, not only to uh, expand information about respite best practices and encourage continuous quality improvement, uh, but to help convince our public and private funders to increase support for promising respite models. And we did that by convening the expert panel on respite research that released this report. Next slide, please. Um, we started the initiative by conducting literature reviews, and I only raise this because I want you to know that this annotated bibliography is available. Um, it did document that there are positive findings about the be benefits of respite, but many equivocal findings as well uh, as a result of significant methodological issues that Kim already talked about. Next slide. Um, the expert panel reviewed the literature and developed a research agenda with six recommendations, and Kim already talked about those, so we can skip right over this slide. Uh, next slide. Uh, but we didn't want it to just be a report. I'll go back one, please. We didn't want this to be a report that just sat on the shelf, so we formed a research, uh, respite research consortium um, to help implement those recommendations. And what we're doing now with the consortium is to identify uh, and link funders to interested researchers to pursue rigorous academic research, uh, as well as to link innovative and exemplary respite services that ARCH works very hard uh, to identify nationally, um, and then connect them to researchers to do serious evaluations. And, and we're working closely with the break exchange, uh, as Kim just explained, to accomplish, accomplish that. Next slide. Uh, last fall, we held a respite research summit, uh, which researchers and funders in the consortium came together to share the progress we had made implementing the expert panel's recommendations. Uh, it was a really wonderful event, international also, which was uh, phenomenal. Uh, we heard lots of new research findings from academia, as well as evaluations of uh, national and state funded respite services. Um, and this resulted, next slide please, in a um, final report that summarized what we learned at the summit, both from presenters and participants, because we engaged um, in some very meaningful roundtable discussions. Uh, we, uh, next slide, please. Um, the report really um, outlined some strong considerations for respite moving ahead. And again, we didn't want this to be another report that sat on the shelf. Um, so we've now convened a committee for the advancement of respite research that's composed of some very uh, prestigious researchers, funders, and advocates. Uh, and they're going to be looking at the findings from the research summit and then focusing and prioritizing those issues that rose to the top um, during the summit. And those are listed here. I won't read through all of them. You, you can see them on the slide. So we're very excited. And uh, Kim is going to be chairing that uh, panel for us, and so we're really excited to, to move forward with this next phase of our journey. Next slide. Back to you, Kim. Yeah, great. Um, so we did include in our slide deck some example research initiatives that we don't have time in our presentation today to go over, but we assume our presentation will be available and would encourage you to take a look at some of the example research initiatives that we highlighted in here. So I'm just going to skip past those for now and kind of get us to the end here where we um, thank you for being with us and sharing this uh, time with us today to talk about respite research. And as a reminder, um, as we're doing this respite related work, that it's important to put on your own mask first before helping others. So make sure that you are continuing to practice your own self-care and give yourself a little bit of respite in the work that you do as well. So our contact information is here and included in our slides if you have more questions and want to reach out to us. So at this time, I believe we have a few minutes left for questions, if anyone has questions for us today. Do, do we have time? Because there were some questions here. Yeah, I think we have a couple minutes for questions. So I'll read this. the first one is a big issue is when you live in a rural or remote community and there's only one service, the relationship is broken down. You as a carer are already isolated. Um, then you lose your support. So that was really more of a, a comment. Um, another question is beyond inclusion, how can carers lead research? That's a good question. Uh -huh. That's a great question. So I think 
But I hope a lot of what I said emphasizes how important it is for CARES to be involved in leading that research. And so joining the Break Exchange is a great way to get connected to researchers who understand um, you know, the methodology of how to connect, conduct the research, but can work really closely with CARES and CARE recipients to help um, figure out what are the questions that really need to be answered and what are what are the things we should measure that matter to carers when we think about research. So again, thinking about serving on a community advisory board or even working on a research project team. So I know for my program of research, personally, I employ an individual with a physical disability and his perspective is incredible in my work to be able to have someone on my research team who has that lived experience. So. Um, lots of ways for carers to get involved and would encourage more carers to get involved in research as well. Great, right, and I see. Can you take one more? Yeah, I think we have time for maybe one, one more question. question. Is what sort of outcomes uh, can we easily measure? Yeah, so that's a great question. I think one of the things we are trying to do is figure out what are those outcomes that matter. I know a lot of the research that's been done related to respite has tried to measure um, individual care outcomes. So stress, fatigue, quality of life are some of the, the measures that we use. And we're really interested in also looking at measures of the care recipient and even family-based measures. So how is the family quality of life impacted by respite care? But even bigger than that, there's also societal outcome measures. So are we um, you know, reducing uh, out-of-home placement, for example? Are we reducing the number of kids that have to go into supportive foster care? Those are some of the other outcomes that we can look at measuring. But really, that's another place where we'd love to have more carers and respite providers that are working day, daily in this work to help us understand what are those things that matter, what are those outcomes that we should be measuring to make sure that we're measuring the right thing. That expert panel report that we referred to as well has a beautiful matrix of suggested outcomes on the uh, carer level, the care recipient level, level, and on the societal level. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at those uh, out suggested outcome uh, measures. Thanks for that reminder, Jill. Um, so I think that's probably our time for questions. But again, feel free to reach out to Jill or I at any time if you have questions. We're happy to talk more. We wish we had more time to share with you, but um, really appreciate the opportunity to present with all of you.